Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for session four of our annual anti-racism training series. We are very fortunate uh, today to be joined by Maria Mendez, who will be speaking on Latino issues and perspectives on racism, and uh, Teresa Lamson, uh, who will be joining us to speak about uh, Native American and ind indigenous uh, perspectives on uh, racism. Uh, Jean-Michel, I'm going to toss to you for a moment and let you say a few words, and then uh, Maria, I have your presentation, so I'll start sharing my screen uh, once Jean-Michel has uh, introduced you. Yes, well, thank you, uh, Chris, and uh, thank you to our two speakers for sharing uh, this afternoon. Thank you all for being online. I know we're on a tight schedule, so I'm going to turn this over to Maria right away. Hopefully you're see hopefully you're all seeing uh, a PDF of a PowerPoint there, are you? Yes. Yes. Very good. Okay. Maria, over to you. Okay. Okay. Well, hi everyone. I hope everyone is having a good afternoon slash morning. Um, so my name is Maria Mendez. Um, I'll introduce myself, tell you guys a little bit about me. Um, so I'm actually a case manager at Friendship Place. I work for a permanent supporting housing program, and I've been there for about a year. Um, uh, just a little preface, last year I was also working abroad in Guatemala in maternity clinics. So while I was there, I was doing a lot of work with like midwives and a lot of like social justice work. So it's, um, it's been really interesting to see like how racism is like the differences between there, the cultural aspects between here and there. Um, so it's just a little bit about me. Um, Chris, if you could go to the next slide, please. Oh, there we are. Um, and that's a picture of me and my cat. <laughs> um, so I just wanna get started. Um, if people feel comfortable to participate, I just wanna know like what you, uh, has brought you guys here. What are you curious about? Um, since we're talking about like Latinos, right? in this presentation, I want to know like if you guys have um, any, seen anything or have any experience with how Latinos have been per perceived in society, if anyone feels comfortable sharing. Yeah. You're muted, Ellen. Uh, yeah. Hello, Perfect. Maria. I'll go first. Um, I yeah, have been learning you. over our, our training sessions about how racism has affected other people other than black Americans. You know, as a black man, I was, you know, focused on how it affected black people, but attending this has just shown me that it affects a lot of different cultures, you know, and we're not alone. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Um, I'll, I'll say something that really shocked me recently. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen um, the, I don't even know how to call it, like the the recent Trump Trump uh, speaking, the comedian that came on. Yes, um, we saw. He, right, so um, just him, you know, talking about all that, about Puerto Rico, um, saying that Latinos are only there to have, like have babies, that's all we do. Um, it just really baffled me, <laughs> right? But, um, you know, this is just how a lot of people have are perceiving us, right? Are perceiving Latinos in society, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, we're we're right. planning a, a memorial service for the six Jesuit martyrs who were uh, killed by the military in El Salvador in 1989. They were uh, preaching this... Uh, preferential option for the poor and uh, try, attempting to address the two centuries of oppression of the Salvadoran people by the um, by gov the government and with our assistance during their civil war with um, arms and loans and uh, funding. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, um, we're aware of the Central American uh, condition of oppression and uh my my daughter is now in omaha and i'm just learning about the indian tribes in omaha who uh there is one ponca indian who won the first civil rights case 
in the United States and when the United States acknowledged that an Indian was uh, a person. And he he sued because of his, they had taken away his land and his property and he kept persisting and and an Omaha, Nebraska lawyer took on the case and it's the first successful civil rights case won in America. Right, thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, I guess I'll talk a little bit about it in the presentation, but um, there's just a lot of like intertwining with like Native Americans, indigenous from Latin America, um, that just has a lot to do with like colonization, right? The invasion of the Portuguese and the Spanish. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Um, Nicole wants to share. Hi, so um, I'm, a, I'm a Latina. My mother is from Puerto Rico. My father is Honduran and I was born in Honduras. Mm -hmm. um, I'm here because, well, I've, I've joined um, the last call as well, but um, I'm here, uh, my family, didn't really hear a lot about um structural racism and systemic racism uh in my in my household I think this is something that as um as a community as far as like, in my experience we don't really talk about it a lot um so mm -hmm. you know I've just been diving deep deeper lately into in into this and um you know, I, I've been talking about it with my family and my friends. And so I want to educate myself more so that also I can share more with my family and friends. Of course. Thank you. Um, I am a first generation Latina, so I completely understand where you're coming from. These conversations about structural systemic racism, even racism as a whole, isn't really talked about in our communities, um, which is unfortunate, but you know, as people are here, you know, in the United States, immigration, all that, I feel like these conversations are being had so much more. But um, I just, I wanna also preface this. Um, I don't know everything, I am also learning. So if there's anything like during this presentation that you guys wanna add, or if you have any questions, suggestions, et cetera, please raise your hand or add a comment. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think that, I don't know, Toby, Ms. Toby spoke already. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm here to learn. And also in the context of uh, Trump's threat to start a mass deportation, this is going to affect everyone, including some, a white woman like me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's definitely very scary. Um, okay, so just to get started a little bit. Um, so just a structure wise, right? So I want to go over some key terms. Um, which is based off like identity, key term, um, structural and systemic racism and what that looks like. Um, I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about history, acknowledgement, show video as well. And then um, I am a case manager, so resources are really important to me. So I have added a couple of resources, videos that you guys can utilize, articles, um, and then some organizations in DC who are like very involved actively doing the work with Latino communities, right? And then we'll have some questions afterwards if there are any. Okay, next please. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, I added this like saying language is power because I just really feel like um, there's, there's so many ways to describe these words, right? Um, but it's just, it's so important to like have these in our vocabulary. Um, so I'll just start with just racism. Um, so it's one views of capacities of human traits among different racial and ethnic groups that produce an inherent superiority or inferiority of a particular race. Um, so in the United States, like while I was doing all these researching and reading articles, um, I noticed that this was very much related to Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans, since these are like the historical groups here in the U.S. Um, moving on, I have individual racist, sorry, interpersonal racism. So treating others with direct discriminatory behaviors from microaggressions to physical violence. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about microaggressions in a few. Um, we have institutional racism. So policies or behaviors within an organization intended to discriminate against people of color 
um, so an example of this can be like a hiring manager disqualifies job candidates based on their names, based off their last names, or like um, you can't get a job because it's like your hairstyle, right? So that's kind of a structural racism, um, institutional racism that we can see. Um, the next is structural racism. So these are cultural values embedded in society um, that are seen as normal and the way that things are. Um, so we can kind of think about this as like redlining, right? Redlining is it's illegal, right? But we still see the effects that redlining um, has had on our communities. Um, more poor, poor neighbor, neighborhoods have like fewer resources, less access to education, less access to um, to supermarkets, right? Um, and then lastly, we have systemic racism. Um, so it's discrimination that is, sorry, this is a difficult word, perpetuated within a system that has racist principles or practices um, embedded in laws and policies. Um, so just laws and policies regulations that result in different outcomes for different um, different races, right? Um, so now moving on, we have stereotypes and microaggressions. Um, I'll start with stereotypes. It's a generalized belief or expectation about a group of people which often are based off characteristics such as age, gender, race, or ethnicity. Um, Stereotypes can be, I've noticed that they can be very harmful, of course, but they also have an aspect of them that can be unharmful, right? Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about like a personal experience um, with a, um, I guess more so like a microaggression, just, um, you know, growing up during like the early 2000s, you didn't really see a lot of like brown people on television. Um, and that's kind of like something that's, you like keep in your mind, right? So um, <laughs> just like a silly experience that I feel I wanna share. Um, when I was younger, I had these bangs as well um, and I would get called Dora, right? And like, that can, that's like a microaggression that it's like pretty silly, right? But when I would hear that, I would be like, well, like that doesn't make me feel good. But so it can be something like a joke as a microaggression but it's something that in the long term can be really harmful. Um, so microaggressions, indirect subtle discrimination that can be in form of a statement, action, or incident against members of a marginalized group. Um, Vivian, thank you, your, your feelings are validated. <laughs> um, so just, just another form of like microaggressions, it can include things that, things that I've heard, things that um, I've, other people have told me they've heard like, um, you speak English very well, like saying that like in a professional setting, like that's completely inappropriate. Um, you are so exotic, right? Comparing any anyone to exo like exoticness, you think of an animal, you know? Um, or like you're so spicy, right? That's something that you hear. Um, but yeah, so even if they're harmful over time, microaggression, they can definitely like impact someone's self-esteem, sense of self-worth, Object objectification exactly um, and make you feel like you don't belong um, so yeah um, so moving on okay colorism um, colorism is prejudice or discrimination against individuals with a darker or just dark skin tone and it can even be seen among people of the same ethnic and racial groups there's there's a lot of this in the Latino community um uh like just I think that's based off a lot of like just Western culture, right? That you see like in the movies, um, in the products that we use, um, of just like the colorism. Um, so I'll give some another personal example, right? Um, when I was younger and I recently realized this that uh at home we had something called a concha cream, which is a whitening cream, and I had no idea that we had this in like my my mother's bathroom but it's just something that's like so ingrained within our society right because of that colorism um okay so moving on how has erasure affected identity um so i wanted to include this specific thing because just because of a lot of like colonial 
as well. Um, there's, there's so many ways that us as Latinos can identify, whether that's Hispanic being Latino, Latinx, indigenous, mestizo, Afro-Latina. Um, and I really like the saying right here that I put that says, I'm not willing to com complementalize my identities. I am all that I am. I, I am all the time. And I just really like that saying because it just kind of shows that um, you can be Latino, but you can also be so many other things. There's so many other things that fall under that rainbow, right? Can we move on, please? Okay. Um, okay, so now moving on to a little bit of systemic and uh, institutional racism. Um, before I move on, does anyone have any questions about just identity and those um, terms that we went over? Perfect. Okay. Um, so I'll start with the uh, wealth and employment gap. So wealth inequality, right? It's yes, yes, Sarah, definitely. Um, so wealth inequality, it's extremely prevalent and it it affects Latinos and communities of color. Um, data shows that the median wealth for white families is five times higher. I cannot see them. Oh, okay. Someone in the chat says that they can't see the slides. And we can, Maria. Okay. It may be Vivian's. Uh, yeah, I think everyone else can see. Also, okay. it's probably good to hold questions to the end because I know that you have a hard stop, Maria, and then we also have um, Teresa to speak. Okay, also. cool. Okay, awesome. Okay, so... Um, so yeah, so I'll move on to the discriminatory, uh, discriminatory practices in the gap in housing. So like I said earlier, practices like redlining and white flight, even though redlining is illegal, we still see that it carries a compounding effect on communities. Um, you can see this in effects like um, Latinos getting less opportunity for loans, right? Um, access to better education, so there's not a lot of um, schools nearby, there's not a lot of supermarkets with healthier food in them, right? Um, number, the gap in education. So the gap in education, there's still a significant gap in degree attainment in the Latino population. So only about 28% of Latinos have attained a degree. Um, and there's, there's just so many barriers to this. Um, like just there's no bilingual services right there's no bilingual tutoring no bilingual career counseling um there's not a lot of outreach in um high schools right so that you know students have the opportunity to see that okay yeah i do see myself going to higher education i see myself getting a degree and having a career we don't really see this right and then uh for drug arrest um, government surveillance and violence, arrest and incarceration. Um, I feel like all of those are kind of tied together a bit. Um, one in six Latino males will be incarcerated at some point in their life. Latinos are up to four times more likely to be incarcerated than white people. And I think this is just like the, again, like the, um, our access to opportunities, right? We, we don't see this growing up. Um, we, we, we see like people who are already for example, in, in gangs, right? Um, so we see like it's normalized, right? Um, and then for the fifth one, mortality, um, specifically COVID that I found affected the Latino population so much um, because of the kinds of jobs that the population works, so, you know, like the frontline workers, we work in like hospitals, farm workers, grocery stores. These are all essential things that couldn't, be closed down during COVID. Um, yeah. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so just to add on um, a little bit of public health, the racism being a public health issue, right, in the Latino community. Um, so Latinos are less likely to have any form of health coverage, partly because having health insurance usually depends on your job. Um, many Latinos are in jobs that don't offer health insurance such as farm workers, um, what else? I guess like grocery stores, a lot of Latinos are also working um, under the table jobs, right? Um, I've even heard stories about people working jobs under the table and they like, uh, 
I guess, confront their their manager about wanting health benefits, and the manager responds like, "I'll I'll deport you," right? So this this is a big public health issue, right, that we have in this country. Um, another thing, bilingual health services aren't guaranteed in hospitals, leaving behind 15 million Latinos who don't speak English very well. And I included indigenous languages, which is, um, I feel like it's non-existent here in the United States. Like we don't see any representation of indigenous languages, cachiquel, quechua, whatever it is. So just people who are going to these hospitals needing services, um, they don't get this help, right? There, there's that barrier of language. Um, and then this also leads me to uh, Latinos are more likely to have certain health conditions, including diabetes and obesity. This can be because of lack of health care, right? Lack of factors um, such as where you live, where you work, right? Next slide, please. Okay, so um, just another factor, housing, homelessness, and systemic racism. Um, where you live can determine the quality of your education. It can determine, um, you know, your wealth and even your health. Affordable housing and buying home are especially difficult for Latinos to attain. Um, just that the us not being able to like get a, a loan, right? There's a percentage, a lower percentage of Latinos that don't qualify for housing loans, right? And if they do qualify, it's going to be, a, you know, unattainable, right? And this is not even for um, undocumented Latinos. There's just, um, buying a home is so difficult, especially when you qualify for less loans. Um, there's not really a lot of generational wealth as well, especially again, among immigrants. And then um, growing up, you're not, I, I feel like in older generations too, you're not really taught the tools needed to like know how to buy a home, how to start that process. Don't go to the doctor. Yes. Okay. Um, according to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Latino homelessness is increasing faster than other groups. Latinos make up 24% of the total number of people experiencing homelessness in the U.S., but only 19% of the total population. Um, right here, this kind of confused me. I still put it, but it kind of confused me a little bit because I was like, why is that number so different? And I feel like it's because there's a lot of um, undocumented people experiencing homelessness um, that aren't accounted for. Um, and again, all of this is just because like lack of um, translation services, um, people don't know that they have access to, let's say like vouchers, for example, lack of knowledge of resources and lack of funding, right? Next, please. Okay, uh, so lastly, jobs in the economy the job market in the United States is built on segregation. It continues today with a system that devalues the work of people of color. Um, an example of this is the New Deal. Um, it brought a 40 hour work week, a federal minimum wage and overtime protection. But unfortunately, Latinos are often excluded from these benefits because the laws don't apply to domestic agricultural or service jobs, which is the jobs that make up Right, but most of Latinos work these jobs. Um, and I want to use um, a law. I'm not sure if it was passed, but it was in Florida, where because of due to um, climate warming, um, global warming, um, like workers were trying to get protections, right? So like if it's under a certain um, temperature, you're not, you don't go into work, right? Because it's dangerous. People were passing out working on farms. Um, but that's just an example of like the inequalities that we see in the, the job economy, right? Um, Latinos are least likely to have paid sick days, are forced to choose between getting paid, caring for themselves, or a sick family member. Next slide, please. Okay, so I have a, a little video here. Um, we don't, I know that we're running, I don't want to super pass the time, but we can play a little bit of it. Uh, I just wanted to kind of show like a little bit of the history, right? Because we talked about all of these other things. Um, what do you think, we, Chris? We saved it as a PDF, so unfortunately, we're not going to be able to click on this. But we okay. can put the link. Oh. We can put the link. We, that's okay. We can send the link to people afterwards. Oh, okay, okay, oh, okay. Oh, well, I hope that you guys watch it. It's really interesting. He's a great author. Um, yeah, yes. he kind of just talks about like the 
pe pe um, people in the past and the history who have like done the work, right? Um, just the the history, the forms of um, oppression, et cetera. It's really good. Um, but okay, I hope you guys watch it. Um, so lastly, I just put this really nice thing I felt because all of these topics are really heavy, right? Like even when I was, um, you know, doing this uh, presentation, I was like, wow, this is so, it's so much, right? It's so much information. So um, it's just so important, joy, rest, and community. They're just, they really are just forms of assistance, right? Especially for people who work in the field, right? Who are surrounded by all of this. We hear experiences, we deal directly with people who are experiencing this. Um, just to like find the joy and the rest that we want to, right? Um, so yeah, and then the next slide is uh, just the resources and the organizations in DC that I was talking about. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that the, the links work. If not, Chris, you can let me know and I'll find the links. Very good. Yeah, but that is all. Thank you so much. And if you guys have any questions, please let me know, or you guys can reach out to me via email. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for coming in and doing this. It's so appreciated. And for all the work that you do at La Casa for the, the men we serve there. So thank you for your time today. And uh, yeah, just for everything. So um, I do want to move us on to Teresa. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we appreciate you. Yes, very much. Um, so we'll send yes. contact. Yes, uh, 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 Maria, if it's okay, I'll send your contact information. When I send a follow-up email, I hope that's okay. That's fine. I can also put it in the chat right now for people. Yeah. Very so thank good. you guys so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, and so Teresa, um, you should be able to unmute yourself here. So, and then I will make you co-host when that, uh, once you're unmuted. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I am. I don't know. I think Alan was going to introduce me. I'm not Alan, sure. Would you like to introduce? Sure, why not? <laughs> um, hello, Teresa. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, Teresa came to us through another contact, and we met her a week or so ago, and we are very happy that she is here. She is new at her current job, but she has life history of Native American issues and reservation living and things like that. And I will turn it over to Teresa. Y'all didn't come here to listen to me flatten my lips. So <laughs> Teresa, thank you for being here. And it's your show. Thank sure. You. Thank you, guys. Give me a chance to set up this PowerPoint. Yep. And you should be sure. host. You should. There you go. Perfect. All right. And I should be able to. Um... Now, you should see my slide. Everything worked out well. Um, I want to start, though, with an anecdote and to give just a little bit more background. I am a tribal member of the Osage Nation, which is located in northeastern Oklahoma. This is I'm going to talk fast at first because I'm trying to get through everything. But that's where I grew up. I spent my life and my career. Uh, I was first a journalist. I uh, started a tribal newspaper for the Osage Nation in my late 20s. That led me to seeing my own deficiencies in education. I had a wonderful opportunity, a very unique opportunity to attend the University of Missouri School of Journalism for graduate work. And I did my master's and stayed on for a PhD. But when I went, I had this two and a half year old son, okay, who's now 32 and a sixth year resident in neurosurgery at Yale. And Alan wanted me to give you a little background on that, which I'll do in just a minute. Um, but he basically grew up in academia, I can say, <laughs> because after that, um, I went to work in Omaha at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. And uh, of course, had my I was a single parent since he was age two. Uh, took my little boy with me, and in my first week on the job, I parked my car. Oh, Chris, you have a question. Yeah, I was saying you may want to hit the use slideshow up top because we can see what we're seeing here are your notes in your next slide. Just so oh, you know. okay, okay. Let's see. Does that work? Perfect. Uh, Thank now. you so much. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, that's okay. But now I can't see my notes. 
<laughs> oh, okay. Whatever works let, best for you then. <laughs> uh, let me here. I think this will actually maybe do it better. You still see my notes? I can see we can see your notes, but if you need to see your notes, we want to be respectful. Is that, that okay, guys? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Whatever works I, for I, you. I need to see them on some slides, but maybe not all of them. No, whatever. whatever uh, let's see best. if I swap displays. How does that do? That works very nicely. Can you see your okay. notes? Yeah, I have them on a different screen. Right. So ah. I kind of like this sometimes. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> yes, we do, unfortunately. Of course. Well, thank okay. you. Okay. Well, okay. So I'm on the job in Omaha, University of Nebraska, Omaha. I'm parked. I come out after my first day on the job. And it probably helps you to know that I had tribal tags on my car. And uh, that just means the Osage Nation, like any other federally recognized native nation, can issue their own license plates. And so I had one of those on my car. I came back to my car to find a um, flyer, you know, as we often find flyers stuck under our windshield wipers. And I picked up the flyer, not thinking much about it. And it was actually... Um, like a sick joke. And it was a flyer to hunters for a game. And the game was, if you could shoot and kill Native Americans in their car, you got points. If you shot and killed a child, a Native child in the car, you got additional points. I, of course, <laughs> went to campus security about it and all of that. And the university was very supportive of me. But I say that before I get into the more structured part of the presentation here, I say that because about, I don't know, maybe a month or two later, my son and I are driving in my car, probably going to some of his school thing. And somebody behind us in a car is just like going crazy, honking the horn. I can't, I can't really make it out, but I can see in my rearview mirror that it is kind of a carload of people and I kind of see hands waving and I see a lot of honking. So as a driver, I'm automatically thinking, is my door open? I mean, what's what's going on? And but not my son. My son, who's in third grade, is terrified because he thinks it's hunters after us. And they come up alongside of us and uh you know, all, I, I can't even, it's been a year now, but all the fear that's going on, my son is out of his seatbelt, wanting to get on the floorboard. And I look over, it's a car full of other Native people. They see my car tags and they're just excited to say hi. So if we're going down the road, they roll down their window and they're like, hey, cousins. And it was actually some people from the Omaha tribe. I think that incident stayed with my son for a very long time. I don't know if you know of any high school teenagers who don't want to drive, but that was my son. And I even bought him a used car. I mean, it was really used, but it was good, right? And he wouldn't drive. He He's a senior in high school, refuses to drive to school. Uh, I mean, I tried to bribe him to do that. But I think it's just a reminder to me, he does drive now to work and everything, <laughs> but it's a reminder to me of how lasting one thing, you know, one incident of racism can linger in somebody's life. And so that's what I thought it would be helpful to start with basic, a basic understanding, a lot like what your colleague Marie just did. And I was so glad to see that she had a little bit of information on identity, because I think this, when we explore identity or maybe how we talk, it's, it's definitely a step toward dismantling stereotypes and fostering respect. Let's see if, if I can advance my slide. And here you see, my new job. I am the Director of Research and um, Strategic Initiatives at the Indigenous Media Freedom Alliance. And that is led by longtime journalist Jody Rave Spotted Bear, the founder and executive director. I can tell you she wears a lot more hats than that. <laughs> this woman is working and going all the time. Uh, they also published uh, a digital 
independent news site called Buffalo's Fire, and it primarily covers uh, Native issues in North Dakota. So for Native Americans, identity is deeply tied to legal, cultural, and historical frameworks, and those are very often misunderstood or overlooked. Even in my own life, my job experience growing up, a lot of the things I'm going to tell you today are based on just my experience of having to answer so many questions related to these things. So Native identity is a matter of legal recognition by the federal government and by tribal nations. It involves citizenship in sovereign nations, tribal enrollment, and a connection to ancestral lands, languages, and traditions that make us a distinct people. When Native identity is misunderstood or lumped into a more generalized areas of identity, it can erase the very real specific challenges that Native communities face, such as the challenges to sovereignty, land rights, cultural preservation. And it is vital that we recognize this distinction as part of combating racism against Native Americans, because misunderstanding Native identity contributes to the invisibility of Native issues and can perpetuate harmful stereotypes. Another quick, uh, Marie um, reminded me of a anecdote that I have in my own life that I saw over and over, and that is people feeling very uncomfortable being able to put my son in a racial category. So at times he got called almost any racial slurs there was. And he he was of course bothered by it, but also somewhat amused because he's like, well, they don't know what I am. One day they're calling me chief. One day they're calling me chink. I know that one of my son's dreams when we were in Omaha was to attend a, a Jesuit prep school for boys. And it was, it, it will, is called Creighton Prep. And I didn't have the money to do that, but my son worked really hard, got four scholarships and attended Creighton Prep. And he was one of the few boys of color who attended this institution. Uh, he went on, and this is something Alan wanted me to tell you, he went on to um, undergraduate in biology at Stanford University. He stayed at Stanford for medical school. And as I told you, is now at Yale doing uh, final years of residency in neurosurgery. So education and the doors it opens is a whole different talk. So what do we call Native people in the U.S.? I often see a lot of confusion around this. Indigenous is a very broad term, but with Native Americans, it's not always popular. In fact, I would say that sometimes that can create a bit of, of tension around the word. So officially, uh, Native people are often referred to as Native American or uh, American Indian Alaska Native, which is the federal government's official, I guess, name for Native Americans. Um, but it's always best to be specific. So you say Teresa is Osage. You don't say Teresa is a Native American, uh, unless there's some reason to be, uh, you know, like the Native Americans in attendance were Teresa Lomsom in parentheses, Osage, you know, that kind of thing. And when you refer to tribal communities, I think it's always best to figure out how they call themselves. So for me, it's the Osage Nation. But you see here on the screen, I have an example of the Fort Sill Apache tribe. They refer to themselves as tribe. Still others in California might refer to themselves as band. And I, I think this is a way to pause and acknowledge the diversity among tribes and even within tribes, there's a lot of diversity. So that's why it be, can become very difficult to have one person speaking on the whole population of uh, these hundreds of tribes across the US. Then we have another distinction, urban or rural and within Native communities, we talk about this a lot because it creates challenges, very specific challenges based on these locations. So the 
majority of the native population is located in urban areas. Uh, they have challenges, of course, connection to culture, uh, disconnection from uh, their tribal communities, access to health care, even though these cities are supposed to have this, you know, all this uh, access to health care. Even me here uh, near New Haven, it's the first time in my life that I didn't have access to Indian Health Service. And that's because Connecticut does something weird. Um, you should be able to be native and live in any state and have access to Indian Health Service, but I don't here. In the urban areas, there's also this tendency to identify with a pan-Indian type culture. So that just means that we'll talk more about that when we talk about relocation, but that's more about this collective type culture where we have the shared background, some shared traditions and values, and we tend to congregate around those. You saw that happening in particularly in Los Angeles, Seattle, Minneapolis, Chicago, Kansas City, as some of the places that natives were relocated to. Rural natives may reside in or very near to their reservations. Um, and keep in mind, this is where the seat of power lies. This is the same location as the tribal government. And these natives often maintain stronger cultural ties because they're still practicing some of the traditions. And just to briefly go over types of Native American identity, it's not as though these are um, you can think of these as kind of more of an academic exercise or a way to really get your head around uh, how people may see themselves or not even see themselves, but just how it, how connecting to being a Native American may occur in our communities. So there is cultural, this is me. I grew up on my reservation. I have strong cultural ties, uh, practicing the traditions, even though we no longer live there. I'm living in Connecticut with my son and his family. We still work to maintain that connection. Then there's something kind of to categorize as cultural revival. And this may be something that is very relevant to me now. I don't know how many of you may have read the book or seen the movie Killers of the Flower Moon. But ever since that came out, everybody's Osage. I have so many cousins now I didn't even know I had. And this is, you know, kind of what we call the cultural revival. They, a bad thing, okay? <laughs> um, am I still coming across? Can somebody give me, I just heard my internet was unstable. Okay. Maybe then there you. is what, what we just talked about was the collective pan-Indianism. And then there's, the card holding. And this is probably talked about more in native communities than elsewhere, but this is a very political identification. You have to possess a tribal enrollment card. It's an official membership. And this is what the federal government requires. This is what tribes require to be considered a native American. Of course, this disenfranchises a lot of other people. Then there's the mixed and multi-tribal. So for multi-tribal, many tribes allow uh, dual membership or multiple membership in different tribes. I'm Osage, but I'm also Ka. The Ka Nation does not allow for dual membership, so I only hold membership in the Osage. Then there's mixed. And we've actually, with Jody, we've um, done some UX interviews, and this has come out in those interviews. And that is Black Native Americans are experiencing quite a bit of racism from within Indian country. And by Indian country, I mean the, the whole of Native Americans and tribes and communities across uh, the United States. So it is something that's going unacknowledged. It's being talked about. When I was younger, I saw this at play uh, when with the development of casinos and the casinos being so you know lucrative. Some tribes, I say this based, it was based on greed. That's my opinion, but some tribes started um, cutting off parts of their membership. And for at least a couple of tribes, that membership included cutting off 
uh, Black Native Americans. And so I think this is, an, as, as a journalist, I think this is an area that needs to be explored more. Ancestral, that's like, we just did my mom's ancestry. It's like ancestry DNA. And we know that woman is pure European descent, okay? And we get it back and she's 2% Native American. And we're all just like, what? And that's the type of, th that's what I mean by ancestry. It's like, there's no, well, of course my mom has a connection. She's married to my dad, but they find out through some kind of ancestry thing that they have a connection, but that's usually as far as it goes. So we talked a lot about membership and I'm trying to get it to advance to this next slide, sorry. Who determines memberships? Well, usually it comes down to a mixture of these three things and that the the most accurate answer is the tribal government's determinant. Some of them are still using a very antiquated racist legacy of blood quantum. I do believe I shared with uh, Alan and Chris in the group a um, link. And if you wanna add that link to the chat now, but here is an incredibly good article about uh, the troublesome legacy of blood quantum and why we shouldn't still be using that as tribes. There's also lineage. It's a direct descent from a recognized federal tribe. And that's how the Osages do it. Some people will do lineage, but they add on geography. So you have to actually reside within the tribal territory in order to hold membership or to vote. And to briefly just go over, there's been this constant battle between the racialization of Native Americans and sovereignty. While tribal nations assert their political and cultural um, sovereignty, U.S. policies historically aim to erase those identities and assimilate Native people into mainstream society. These policies treated Native Americans as a racial group to be integrated rather than as sovereign nations with distinct political and cultural rights. This erasure has caused lasting harm, particularly through the loss of, loss of land, community ties, and traditional governance. And we're gonna look at those in spotlight, this one, the 1956 Indian Relocation Act. I'm putting the spotlight on this one because it's so related now even to housing. The act aimed to relocate Native Americans from reservations to urban areas with the stated goal of providing them jobs, training, housing. But the underlying goal was really, it was a means to assimilate Native Americans into mainstream society and weaken tribal ties. The housing difficulties experienced during the relocation contributed to the cycle of poverty and displacement that continues to affect many Native Americans to this day. And then if we look at the rural areas or the reservation areas, decades of funding, uh, underfunding and neglect have contributed to a critical housing shortage on tribal lands, including mine, leaving many Native Americans in unsafe or unhealthy living conditions. To talk about that would of course be a whole nother talk, but it's, it's, uh, let's look at it. I think we have enough time to look at the systemic racism and discrimination that's tied to it. I'm trying to, I can't see my time. Let me look at my watch. Okay. So racism has deeply contributed to the housing crisis in Indian country by restricting access to quality housing, financial resources, and infrastructure. So institutional racism has created this underfunding and neglect because our needs are consistently overlooked or deprioritized. Then we have systemic oppression that basically hampers Native nations from practicing self-determination. And it set up this really weird, unhealthy system of making tribes compete against each other for federal funding. And I heard one tribal leader from a smaller tribe say, oh, all we ever get are the crumbs left on the table. And then, you know, stereotypes and prejudices to this day continue to influence policy and, and the funding. And then there's the whole idea of environmental racism 
uh, where hazardous waste sites are placed next to native communities or what we think of maybe as polluting type industries, those are lo located near these native communities, which presents its own challenge to building healthy homes. Uh, systemic issues like these have made it challenging for native communities to access stable and safe housing, both on reservations and in urban areas. So thank you. I'll leave that up there for a moment, if that's okay. So you can scan that uh, code and get a uh, email for me, or you can just copy it down there. And I'm going to stop sharing. That's okay. There we go. And Alan, I, Chris, if you want to call on people, I'm afraid I'm going to miss people. But Alan does have his hand raised. Uh, Alan, go right. You're muted, Alan. Hey, no, I'm not muted. Um, you mentioned, you know, that the diversity of Native American tribes and identity. Is it okay to ask? someone of Native American heritage, what their tribe is? Is it already oh, is please. It to ask them that? Please do, yes. Okay. Secondly, I've never heard that there were Black Native Americans. Could you touch on that real quick? Uh, yes, I think a lot of that happened during the first era of removal. And as these tribes were relocated and taken across states, uh, some stopped, some intermingled with other communities, and of course that continued on and uh, still does to this day. I, my tribe is one that uh, thankfully has embraced that and continues to this day. Okay, thank you. One last thing. I was watching a program on discovery or history or something last week, and they stated that when the Europeans got to this country, there were between five and 40 million native people living here. And they equated what the Europeans did to the Native Americans here to the Holocaust. Mm. And I had to turn the TV on. They said it went from whatever the number was to just over a hundred and some thousand. They had killed that many Native Americans through disease and war and all kind of stuff. So that makes yeah, me look That's true. That's also the same type of history I've seen and read. And it's also, there's something we refer to now as cultural genocide. I do have to say though, because I have a lot of French heritage and it's not like I'm trying to plug the French and the French Canadian, but uh, the French in particular were very good to my tribe. And we first encountered the French as fur traders. And uh, some of them set up, you know, trading posts, but we still maintain a very good relationship with a town in France that's kind of kind of like a sister city type thing. But we have close ties and many Osages are now starting to learn the French language. That may strike you as something you wouldn't expect, but it's happening. Oh. Thank, no, thank, thank you. you. Toby, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you very much. Um, two questions. One following on what Alan just said. Is an okay question to be, oh, what tribe or nation are you from? Is that is that an okay way to ask that question? Yes, please do. The only person you're going to upset is somebody that nowadays is called a pretendian or a fake Indian, which we are, uh, especially because of what's been going on in our news media for quite a while now, it's been presenting all sorts of problems for us uh, because it's one way that misinformation and even disinformation campaigns are being led by people who purport to be native and aren't really but they're able to spread disinformation. Okay, the second question. Um, I've watched the uh, TV series Reservation Dogs and a little yeah. bit of Dark Winds. Reservation Dogs just seem so incredibly good. What, what do you think about those shows? Yeah. Thank you. 
Well, of course, I love Reservation Dogs because so many of my friends are in it. Uh, but I thought, it, first of all, it's hilarious. It It's very true to, uh, you know, the stereotypes we create about ourselves uh, to be funny. And uh, I loved it. And I, li I liked Dark Winds, too. Uh, it was a different take. There's another comedy called Rutherford Falls. Uh, it's completely different, but I kind of liked it, too. Thank you. We have time for one more question. And I see, Joanna, you have your hand up. And then I will toss to Yimka and then Jean-Michel before uh, saying thank you. So, Joanna. I tried to. Here you are. There you go. Um, maybe I missed it, but I, I didn't hear you say anything about um, taking children away from their families and into uh, special schools for Indian children and taking away all of their customs and not letting them speak their languages and all the abuse that they suffered. Yes, that's very, Joanna, thank you for bringing that up because I uh, did not, there were so many things, that being one of them that I did not put into my presentation, but it's critical. It's uh, one of the biggest issues right now faced in Native communities. And when Alan was talking, I mentioned cultural genocide, and that is one way that cultural genocide has played out. Uh, my tribe experienced it a little differently. Uh, because those boarding schools were actually placed on a reservation, but nevertheless, uh, cultural genocide did happen. So thank you, Joanna, for bringing that up. Thank you. So, um, I'm sorry, Chris. If, I don't know. No, I was going to. I was going to throw to you, Yimka. <laughs> okay. So actually, I had one last question. I put in the chat, but for some reason, wouldn't send. Um. So, um. So based uh back to Joanna's question, last question about um. You know. Uh. So how do you perceive Biden's apology? this late this late in the you know this late stage during this late stage um does it matter um i'm somewhat surprised that it hasn't happened but then again not really surprised uh, i don't want to feel come across as cynical because an apology i guess is an apology but it hasn't been that well received in indian country okay um and i think it's just Anytime something can be perceived as being politicized for whatever purpose, I just don't think it's going to be well received. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Teresa. And I don't believe Maria's here anymore because I think she had um, another commitment. Um, but thank you again. Um, I've learned so much, as I'm sure everybody else has. Um, I'm glad. I'm Rita Odibo. I'm the um, chair of the Anti-Racism Task Force here. So I also want to thank all of our participants today for coming and learning with us. Um, and uh, we hope you'll join us for the next uh, training. And that will happen in two weeks. Yes, absolutely. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. John michelle do you want to say any closing yes. words? Well, thank you so much, uh, Teresa. We did all learn a lot and we appreciate you. And it feels like more. So I hope you can join us again you know, another time. Uh, we'd love to talk to you more about all this, of course. Okay. I want to thank uh, Chris for facilitating the call as usual and all the members of the Anti-Racism Task Force at Country Place for organizing this session today. Thank you all for your support. We appreciate you very much. Be well. Take care. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Teresa, thank you so much. Oh, gosh, you're welcome. Bye. All right. Thank you.